Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Uh, hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem Corporation, and we're here today at the uh, 2023 uh, Tri-State Nutrition Conference where Balchem just uh, held a mini-symposia. The title of the symposia was New Revelations in Transition Cow Nutrition. We had four speakers, the first of which was Dr. Mike Van Amberg. His topic was Implications for Understanding Essential versus Required. The second speaker was Dr. Jose Santos. Topic was Choline, a Required Nutrient. Followed by Barry Bradford, How Do We Get the Next Five Pounds of Milk? And lastly, Dr. Heather White from um, University of Wisconsin, new insights from the University of Wisconsin Transition Cow Research Program. I'm also here with my co-host, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Welcome back, uh, Clay. Good to see you again. Yeah, and you good know, to be back. Yeah, and you know the drill. What's in your glass tonight? My usual, the, an angry orchard. This is very, very good. Oh, excellent. Uh, Clay, this is the third in a series of... Uh, uh, seminars that we've put on across the country. Uh, can you tell me um, what was the background of that? Why did we decide to do that at Balcam? Yeah, basically we've uh, we've been sponsoring, as as usual, sponsoring a lot of research, a lot of it related to to reassure through the years, actually dating back well over twenty years now, uh, from a research perspective. But uh, we've had some really seminal studies uh, that have been completed uh over the last uh five to six years so uh, you know i was counting back we've had eight different research studies that uh, have either been published since 2018 or they're in the process right now that are that are really seminal related to this starting back with the original zenobi study that was published in journal of dairy science in 2018 there was the Bellotti study published in 2020, the potts erdman study from 2020. There was another Zenobi calf study published actually last December in 2022. There was the work from um, the Turner Schwartz, Perry Bradford work that was published last year and this year um, out of uh, out of Dr. White's lab here, the Henry Holdorf's work. Uh, that's being published this year. There was the meta-analysis uh, out of Jose's lab, the uh, the Arshad meta-analysis in 2020. And then the, uh, the work that Jose shared this afternoon that is in the process of being published right now that will be published this year. So that's eight different studies. That'll be, that'll be well over 20 uh, peer-reviewed papers that, that will come out of those eight studies. So it's really sort of the next generation work now showing that that choline is a required nutrient for transition dairy cows. Oh, thank you for that, Clay. Tonight's PubCast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit balchem.com to learn more. Dr. Van Amberg, this is getting to be a habit, sir. Uh, yep. Good to see Thank you again. You. Good to see you. <laughs> uh, before we get started, what's in your glass tonight? I think somebody said this is Balvini. Balvini, excellent choice, yeah. Yeah, Dr. Palmquist and I have had that on a few occasions. Yeah, good to see you, Doc. Um, <clears throat> So Clay mentioned the word requirement or required nutrient, and that was the, the basis of your talk. Can you kind of give us kind of sum up what your talk was all about? Sure, Scott. So, so I, you know, when we're formulating diets um, for lactating dairy cows, generally we tend to think about nutrients as required. When we talk about amino acids, we think about nutrients or essential amino acids. They're essential amino acids. We tend to think of those only as required because they're essential. When in fact, if you look at metabolism and you think about, you know, the metabolic demands of a high producing cow, there are other nutrients that are not essential, but are required, right? Non-essential amino acids are not essential, but they're required. Choline, it's not essential, but it's most likely required. 
right? So we can go through all of those pathways and say, hey, you know, we can't manufacture it, right? We can't manufacture it, so that's essential. But if we can manufacture it, that makes it non-essential, but it doesn't remove the need for it, right? So I think that's how I would sum up my talk. Okay, so <clears> then <throat> the, the qu next question would be required for what, Mike? And, then, and, and maybe that's, you ask, maybe I should let you answer that first because I got to follow up. Oh, I think it's required for any use that she has, okay. right? But if you, you know, if you think about uh, amino acids, um, Gerald Bobley ran a study or took data from several studies years ago and, you know, and he was, he was trying to get at the same thing. He, he did it in different ways, but he basically followed essential amino acids through their pathways and then looked at their disposal, right? And almost, you know, when we think about balancing a diet for a, a high producing lactating cow, historically, we kind of think in a linear fashion, right? I'm going to put this amino acid in and it's going to go to milk protein, right? And I still have a lot of, you know, old style nutritionists who say, well, that's the only reason I'd ever feed that amino acid is to get more milk protein. And if I don't get more percent milk protein, it failed. Well, what Gerald was able to show is that those essential amino acids, their carbon could end up in milk protein, in lactose, or in adipose tissue, or in some other, you know, metabolite. So it basically said that carbon can go any, any different direction, many different directions that are obligately required for that cow to be more energetically efficient. Right, so it's not a linear path. Okay, makes sense. Now, you had another question during the presentation you gave at the uh, Cornell Nutrition Conference. You asked the question, um, what do you want? Optimum output, maximum output, or the most efficient output? <laughs> and I'm not sure you answered the question, so I'm going to ask you, can you answer that question? <laughs> sure, sure. I talk about that a lot here lately because of that. Um, so here's my example. Um, let's just, I, let me just use amino acids and essential amino acids. So, so we've come up with a way of describing the requirement of amino acid based on energy, right? But we've picked an optimum value, right? So if I say 1.19 grams of methionine per mcal of ME, that's what we would call the optimum number to get the most efficient use of the energy for whatever that that disposal is going to be for that amino acid. However, it's possible under certain conditions that maybe 1.2 or 1.25 or 1.3 may give you a larger metabolic response, maybe more milk protein, more milk fat, more milk volume, whatever, it, whatever the cow decides she's going to do with it. The question is, is if you had to go from if you had to go from 82 grams of metabol metabolizable methionine to 100 grams to get to that upper bounds, is it economically viable to do that? Right? Biologically, you could say, yeah, I can add some more, and I'm going to get more output. But if your improvement in productivity is three percent, and it took you 15 percent more of the amino acid, then it's it's just not worth it. Yeah. Biologically, there's a response there, but efficiency-wise, it's not worth it. Yeah, makes sense. You know, before we get too far along here, I want to go to the audience, see if there's any questions out there. This question is for Jose, but really it's for more than Jose. Um, you did a nice job of showing positive responses to supplementing choline. But the other part of the question which has been with us forever, is how does it do it? And you suggested that part of it, um, an important part, might be uh, to facilitate export of fatty acids from the liver. Now, it's pretty well established that the export of fatty acids from the liver by, via VLDL is pretty small. It's probably not more than 5% of the total metabolism of fatty acids. But then the next part of the question, Heather showed some data. I had it in my mind. I was going to say, somebody's got to do this, and you did it. Now, if I understood your slide correctly, you showed that choline supplementation increased VLDL output from the liver. You did show that? That's true? 
Yes. Uh, quantitatively, how, how great was that? Oh, what percent increase? Mm. I think it was 20, 25% increase uh, from cells and culture. Yes, uh, and uh, that's the best way to do it, really, uh, because of the difficulties of measuring in vivo. But uh, both Wisconsin Rick Grummer and Dave Pullen from Michigan State have done nice in vitro work. And Pullen did some work from my lab that supported that it's not great. Um, I would think that it'd be important to follow, follow that up and see what is the specific effect of choline. Yeah. Can I jump in, Scott, or do I have to say what I'm drinking before I'm allowed to talk? <laughs> Whiskey Old Fashioned, which I'll point out is not quite as good as when you order them in Wisconsin, but that's okay. Uh, so I think that's a great point. And the reason we do things in cell culture is every model's wrong, but some are useful, right? And just as you point out, when we measure VLDL or any lipid moiety in the cow, the mammary gland's taking that up, the fetus is taking them up, other tissues are taking it up. So it's really hard to tease out exactly how much is being exported. So we did that, but what was really interesting to us and quite surprising actually, was that when we radio labeled fatty acids, we didn't just find them in the exported VLDL, but we found that more of them were being oxidized. So there was an increased TCA cycle capacity. Very few things increased TCA cycle capacity and we were able to absorb that. So more fatty acids are being oxidized to generate energy, more are being packaged and exported. And as it would make sense, if both of those things increase, then we saw less of the third alternate pathway, which is ketogenesis. And so that really suggested to me, and that was several years ago now, that there was differences in nutrient partitioning when we added choline, which means it's having a regulatory effect, not just as a nutrient that's incorporated then. And so that's really interesting. There's also some work, if we look in other species, that suggests the fatty acids that are being incorporated are a different profile. And we can find that in cell culture systems as well. So it's selectively using fatty acids for things. That's kind of where, we're, where we still need to follow up a little bit more. But um, the other thing we observe in the cell culture that mimics what we see in vivo is the glycogen. So we see all these same pathways we see in the cow also occur in the cell culture, which tells us that we can trust it. More importantly, lets us dig into it even deeper, like you pointed out, to really figure out how it's happening. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Uh, my question was related to the uh, colostrum data, uh, quantity and quality. I, I find it interesting uh, research, and I'm glad you guys are doing it. Um, I think our industry needs a lot more of it because the colostrum quantity issue is a really big concern that is probably under-researched. Um, so certainly there's uh, you know, seasonality effects and day length and nutritional impacts and, and uh, uh, environmental impacts that we're noticing. But in the field, we can't seem to get a handle on colostrum qu uh, quantity primarily, perhaps quality as well. And so I'm wondering, based on your data, if there's anything uh, mechanistically you learn from the choline research that gives you broader implications on colostrum quality or where research might lead in the future, um, anything more there to consider? And I, I guess my question is directed to Heather. Um, Dr. Bradford's not here, but anybody else as well. Thanks. Yeah, I can start and certainly others can jump in. Uh, so exactly what you're saying is why we measured it in the first place. We weren't historically measuring colostrum quantity or quality on our research farm, but we heard first from our research farm and everybody else that there was never enough colostrum. In fact, the research farm did not want us to enroll the first few calves from the study because they wanted to be able to pull some colostrum from the right treatment groups and have it in the freezer ahead of time because they were so worried about not having enough. Um, and we hear that from the field all the time, just as you point out. The other thing that we had been hearing anecdotally from farms was that when they fed choline, they got more colostrum. Well, you know, maybe they were measuring it, probably not super precisely, right? But if they say there's more, there must have been noticeably more. And so we were really intrigued to follow up on it. Um, as far as how it might happen, we didn't go too far into that uh, in our paper. I, I didn't touch on it here either because we didn't, we didn't measure anything more than quantity in bricks. So anything I have at this point is hypothesis or speculation. 
But what I do think is that the same mechanisms that support glucose production and energy uh, production in the liver that would support lactogenesis, it's probably also supporting colostrogenesis. And if we're feeding it 21 days before calving, there's plenty of time for that to influence before the colostrum is starting to form. So I would, I would dare say it's probably the same mechanisms. I don't have any data on that yet. So as far as extrapolating that beyond choline, I would say anything that's supporting liver metabolism and would improve milk production, we should probably be measuring colostrum production to see if it's the same effect. I don't know, Jose, you've done plenty of transition cow studies as well. We, we measure colostrum in every experiment. We measure the yield in the very first milking, the fat, protein, lactose, solids, not fat, and IgG content in every experiment in the last 12 years. To be 100% honest, uh, we, did, we pulled to data together from multiple experiments, and we did a large field trial with 21 pens in California. And we pulled all of those data together. We had like almost 6,000 cows. 100% of them were genotyped. We can explain maybe 12 or 15% of the variance in colostrum yield with the information that we gather. Things like genotype, <clears throat> uh, days in the close-up group, uh, diet, nested within experiment, parity, season of Kevin, we explain very little. So if you were to ask me, I think we know very little what affects one cow to give nine kilos of colostrum and the very next cow to give only three kilograms of colostrum. And to my surprise, maybe to my ignorance, was that uh, I work with a smart colleague who's a geneticist, and he looks for mark SNPs that are linked to increase production because it always bothered me that we select this cow to be more productive but we never really select her to give a little bit more colostrum eh? so it solves the issue of the baby calf when they're born and uh, there is really no relationship between the marks be associated with milk yield and the markers that we found to be weakly associated with colostrum yield so yeah uh, mike might have comments here but uh uh, I don't think we explain very well. Cornell has done some work. I've seen uh, Sabina has done some work on that. And they, from what I've seen, they are able to explain very little with the epidemiological data of what dictates if a cow will give more or less colostrum. It's very imprecise at this point. There is a, uh, <clears throat> there's still a very, there's this, not a significant, but to Jose's point, there's a effect of light especially if you're a Jersey, right? Their pineal gland still responds to less light and they will shut down as the days get shorter, right? So long day lighting, short day lighting would be important for them. Holstein's not so much. Very well. <clears throat> Another question, Stephen. Hi, my question is for everybody in the uh, group. I'm Stephen Emanuel. Dr. Van Amberg, you mentioned that when you infused non-essential amino acids, you had a very large increase in milk yield. And Dr. White, you, you showed a very large increase in milk yield with supplementing choline. And Dr. Santos, you showed a, a meta-analysis. My, my point is none of you talked about the glucose supply reaching the mammary gland. To me, it seems you can't get those kind of milk responses without increasing lactose synthesis. Would you comment on the impact of choline on the potential to increase glucose supply to the mammary gland? I'm going to defer to those two on that well, particular the, part. Yeah. Heather already made a comment that maybe there are changes in how the liver process precursors for gluconeogenesis, yeah, like propionate, maybe amino acids, lactate. So it, all the experiments that we've done with coal, I'll speak specifically about choline, we haven't seen a concurrent increase in dry matter intake, okay? So our assumption is that the cow becomes more efficient but we haven't seen the concurrent increase. Somehow she is not using nutrients for things that would be not linked to production, for example. 
which you can come up some hypothesis, you know, what Barry mentioned, this anti-inflammatory effects of phosphatidylcholine that may take nutrients away from the mammary gland. Uh, maybe that part that is part of the story. Or maybe just the flux of carbon in the liver is different now that uh, more is being diverted into efficient gluconeogenic pathways and more becomes available to the mammary gland. So I can tell you, if you do simple math, you know, the supply of nutrients is equal between the control and treated cows. And the data that I saw today from Wisconsin and from Michigan is the same. The intakes were the same, but the cows gave another, you know, as many as five kilos of milk. Yeah. So obviously the way we do energetics is pretty crude. We assume an average value and we assume that everybody uses that equally. And that is obviously wrong. Yeah. Cows have variable ability to utilize nutrients and probably some nutrients affect how they use other nutrients. Yeah? So it's possible that they may synthesize more glucose and it's possible that more glucose gets direct to the mammary gland because they will produce at least two kilograms more milk and that is another 100 grams of glucose. Yeah? Well, that's what I'm trying, that's what I'm getting at with, with my question is that when you look at lactose, of course, it's made up of glucose and galactose, and so it takes two molecules of glucose to make lactose. You can't make more lactose without having more glucose in the mammary gland, so there has to be a sparing effect. The glucose, getting back to what Dr. Bradford indicated, if you reduce inflammation, there's a very good chance less glucose is being utilized by the gut tissues and the immune system, and more is, is reaching the, the mammary gland. So it certainly can be yet less utilization by other tissues. It can also be more production. So the thing that's tricky about glucose is we can't just measure blood glucose and assume that meant more or less liver production of glucose because so many tissues are using it, right? right? Yeah. So the pool size, the blood concentration is a product of production and of utilization, and we've got to tease that out. So in two instances, we've actually observed that Choline supplementation increased regulation of the genes that are rate limiting steps of gluconeogenesis. So in our cell culture model, we observed that and it was unique to choline from methionine when we were looking at if they were mutually sparing. And then we also observed it in liver samples that were actually from Charlie Staples first transition cow study where they sent liver up to us at Wisconsin and we looked at those same pathways. And so we see increases in the genes that control gluconeogenesis, which suggests it's not definitive, it's not the gold standard, but we know that these genes are rate limiting and we know that for those genes, gene expression is correlated with enzyme activity. And so that suggests that there's more glucose production. Even when blood glucose isn't increased, that may have gotten more blood glucose to the mammary gland, which explains more milk lactose synthesis, right? The other thing that's related to that is that we consistently see more glycogen. And that's so intriguing because I remember in grad school measuring glycogen, and then there was this span in the literature where you don't see anybody measured glycogen, right? We all just stopped doing it. And I was someplace, and Don, I don't remember if it was you or someone else, but there was someone who said, why'd you stop measuring glycogen? And I said, I just don't know, but we should start again. So in the cell culture model, we, we measured it and we observed more glycogen. And at first I thought, well, that's because there's no mammary gland draw for that to be glucose, right? There's nothing in the cell culture dish that's telling the liver cell to secrete the glucose so it stores it as glycogen. But Jose and others have shown it in the cows as well and in vivo studies. So I feel pretty confident across several studies that there's regulation of choline directly on the gluconeogenic pathway. Now, just because choline upregulates the genes, the carbon still has to come from somewhere. So I don't know what's being spared, there, with more oxidation of fatty acids, there's certainly the energy to fuel gluconeogenesis, which is a very energetically expensive pathway. What we don't know yet is where the carbon precursors are. Maybe it's more efficient use of propionate and lactate and the gluconeogenic amino acids, like Jose said, but we don't have the data to prove that yet. Thank you. Thank you. I just feel we need to re remember that um, the immune system can suck up a huge amount of glucose. 
And if we can reduce inflammation, that ha may increase the supply at the mammary gland. Yeah. Probably happening through both mechanisms. Yeah. More production and less wasteful use by the immune system and others. Thank you so much. Welcome. Any others from the audience right now? All right. Jose, we haven't officially welcomed you to uh, the exchange tonight. Thank you. <laughs> I see you're enjoying a beverage. Uh, what, what do you have tonight? I'm drinking a Merlot from California. Oh, very well. I know you're a wine drinker. Um, Jose, your talk today was about uh, establishing the fact that uh, choline, in your opinion, is a required nutrient. Can you kind of make that case for us here? I guess Mike already alluded to the definitions of required versus essential, yeah? And the fact that something that is not essential doesn't mean that's not required, and that would be the good example of choline that's used as substrate for synths of other molecules, and those molecules can be synthesized de novo uh, in the body. Nevertheless, when you supplement choline, you see benefits. I think our assumption is that when we formulate diets, the recommendations have to be based, if we look at, for example, the nascent or the NRC, on the best data available. Sometimes data are just not available to establish you have to include this in the diet, and that's the limitation that eventually we have. Yeah, the committee has to make decisions, and they made you know, wise decisions with the data that were available at the time. But a lot of times recommendations are based on preventing deficiencies, yeah? Like clinical signs of disease, supplement selenium so you don't have white muscle disease or vitamin E. But the minimum amounts may not necessarily be the optimum amounts. And I think choline would fit on those, under, those, uh, un under that umbrella. Yeah? Uh, obviously the cow has phospholipid synthesized, otherwise she wouldn't be able to produce milk. She wouldn't be able to secrete milk fat, yeah? Milk fat globule has uh, uh, phospholipid layers there. But we have seen over and over, you know, today in other meetings and the published literature that there are benefits to supplementing it. So this is telling me that what the cow is able to make, at least during the transition period, is not sufficient for optimum uh, animal performance, yeah? Uh, so I am positive that at some point we're going to come up to a, uh, an agreement that uh, there will be a, an amount of supplemental choline to be fed to cows that people will feel comfortable and is based on reasonable, sound scientific data. So my question, follow-up question would be, which cows, right? We've heard forever, and partly it's our problem, right? We started out uh, 25 years ago uh, selling choline uh, for fat cows and fatty liver. Um, and, you know, you ask people today, they'll say, yes, I use Reassure uh, for problem cows. Um, so I'll ask you, uh, is, uh, yeah, what cows so is it for? So, you know, if you dig in literature, Richard Erdman did experiments with very large doses of choline being infused. And mid-lactation cows respond to that, particularly when they had low-protein diet. They respond with more milk. A lot of times we interpret data wrong, yeah? We look at an experiment and we say, you see, they don't respond to choline or... Well, you have to look at the context. What was the dose? Uh, what was the circumstance? What cows were talking about? So a lot of times we conclude things that may not necessarily be real. So I think... Going back to your question, most of the literature today would support supplementing choline through the transition period to cows that will start their second or greater lactation. That's where we have most of the data. I think we still lack data on a uh, dose response to know what is the uh, exact optimum amount of choline to be fed. Uh, we know very little about choline in primiparous cows. We like to assume that they respond exactly the same, but probably if I were to ask Mike and Heather and others who do research, oftentimes we find interactions between parity and the intervention that we apply. So assuming that they behave exactly the same is probably not right, and we don't have enough data on primiparous, and we don't have a lot of data past the transition period. So there, there are still pieces that need to be put together there. Scott, can I add something or, or maybe raise a different 
area of question that I would ask uh, Mike and Jose. So when we say we don't have dose response studies, I agree. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is when we look at the classic studies, we would take a lot of studies and put them together and we'd achieve maybe a linear response or uh, a, you know, quadratic response or maybe a broken stick model, right? And we hung our hats on those and we said, hey, this is the point where we don't get an additional response, right? But that data was comprised of all sorts of different studies. One thing that's really intrigued me is what might be the next generation of data that generates broken stick models or other things, which are these feeding gates, like what we have um, and you know other types of feeding systems where you can mix something in instead of top dress it. So in our study, for sake of time, I didn't go into all this, but we mix the choline into the TMR. So the exact amount the cow ate was not the same for every cow. It wasn't top dressed, right? It was a product of how much feed she ate. And so because we have her exact intake, we know exactly how many grams of choline ion she consumed. And we can regress her outcome, production, ECM, milk fat, any of those we want to, calf growth, on the exact amount of cow intake prepartum. And so that gets to be a really interesting model when we think about required nutrient levels, right? What should the requirement be? Because you can imagine that out of a handful of these studies, we could plot out a whole range of intakes of a nutrient, choline or, or otherwise, and plot that out. So I wonder if you have, have thought about the different ways that we have the capability to do intake studies now that we didn't before and what that might mean for future rounds of NRC or NASM and requirements in general. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot, which is how we got to tying energy and amino acids together yeah. right because you know to your to your point about your model you get one cow come in and she's going to consume you know 15 kilos of dry matter you get another cow come in she's going to consume 19 kilos of dry matter well the first thing we know is that energetically they're very different unless we have two treatments that had a different concentration of the nutrient in it and we can plot it with an interaction of energy and oh, nutrient. Oh, sure, but I, I was assuming it was the same. But otherwise, I agree completely. <laughs> no, well, we did have that in ours. We had sure. a high dose and a regular sure. dose. Yep. But without that, you're right. Everything's confounded by energy, by starch, by amino acids. Right, but that gives us a surface response to say, okay, for every mcal of energy, it looks like we get the best response at this level. Right, because in the end, what we're trying to discover is she's got an energy output, she's got an energy demand. This can't be some gram amount per cow per day because it's going to be tied to whatever her metabolic activity is. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. And she doesn't eat a gram of product. She Never. eats a gram of TMR that was right. mixed with all ingredients yeah. in it out on the farm, right? We don't top dress anything on the farm. Yeah. But we do in our research because that's what's allowed us to do those studies. But now we have the ability at a lot of our research farms to mix things into a TMR and look at it proportionally, which may let us answer these nutrient requirement questions across the range of cows, across the range of production and genotypes and components, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll extend that just a little bit, Heather. The other, you know, within the walls of Morrison Hall, I will push my colleagues to say if you're gonna if you if you're gonna put a diet together and you're gonna test a particular nutrient, make sure nothing else is first limiting. Yes. Right? Because you're only gonna get the best response. You're only gonna get the next best response of your next first limiting nutrient. And God, that's a hard, hard thing to get through. That's not my hypothesis. No, but it's your your observation is going to be limited by whatever else was limiting in the diet. Right? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, just a comment. Uh, so one of the limitations that I see is, let's say Jose develops Jose's choline product. And it's a tough one, yeah? Because how do I know how much of that is released in the small intestine and actually absorb? I think that's where things become difficult to establish with, with a product or a nutrient that has to be protected to be released unless we do things such as intestinal infusion with choline chloride and then we can measure animal response so we bypass or escape whatever the microbes are doing to it and then we and we have some metric or something that tells us this is the value that it's quote unquote optimum 
uh, it is hard to come up because with a number because if you use reassure it might be something but if you use Jose's product, maybe you have to feed maybe twice or three times as much because his protection method is lousy. Yeah? I don't have their technology. And that's where we are going to get in trouble having a body, a scientific body stamping their name and saying, you know, the CNCPS says you have to feed so many grams of choline ion because you may get choline from Balcam or from Santos. And Santos is pretty bad product <laughs> that, that like problem that. exists now jose that just <laughs> so but, but but those are the challenges of establishing needs by the cow yeah i think we'll know as you dig through the literature you know who does research who does and how much should be fed from a particular product but it's tough to talk about product when we're trying to be more scientifically driven and we want to discuss nutrients yeah and just as we don't have one defined metric on doing a requirement definition we don't have the one required or one defined metric for a bioavailability assay either so what's the outcome that we're trying to measure based on the bioavailability is it milk fat is it ecm is it vldl in the blood we don't have that defined right and choline once you feed it goes it, everywhere. It, in that first pass through the gut probably a lot of it never shows up in the mm -hmm. portal vein yeah and that's yeah. what Mike DeVette's work shows. Even when they infuse yeah. choline chloride, they only recover half of it mm -hmm. because tissues are using it. Yeah? yeah. It's in every cell it's membrane there is, nutrient. so it's very hard to quantify. Carrie, any more questions from the audience? <laughs> Maybe a little different twist uh, because something led to my thought process. What Jose said about the um, maintenance of mitochondria, you know, it's one of the things in aging and humans that mitochondria function decreases other things telomeres and stuff so should humans be taking choline and maybe live longer well I, I guess if you were to ask people who work on choline nutrition in humans they'll make lots of cases why we need to get those 450 to 500 milligrams of choline a day but if you talk to people who study cardiovascular disease, they will tell you that maybe you should not take in very large amounts because choline, carnitine are linked to this trimethylamine oxide production that are at least associated with cardiovascular disease. You know this whole story of saturated fatty acids causing cardiovascular disease. Now there's a different twist that when you eat animal products, you eat a lot of carnitine, choline, and uh, during the process of digestion, our microbes will produce this oxide products that they might be the culprit for some of the cardiovascular disease. So you can hear, I think it's, it's real biology. Yeah? There is inadequate, there is an optimum, there is an excess. And I think that applies to every nutrient and choline is no different. Now, relative to your specific question, I'll diverge to somebody else if they want to comment on choline and mitochondrial survival and activity. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> the other data we have on mitochondrial genes are on genes. Usman, who's sitting back there, measured genes linked to mitochondrial activity, but we don't have functional data to say that they really differ. If you'll be around tomorrow, I have a little bit of data from our mid-lactation feed efficiency work. Uh, that shows some interesting interactions with oxidation and mitochondrial function and choline and metabolomics work. Well, uh, that was my kind of follow-up to bring it back to dairy, is if, if cost wasn't an issue, you, you know, you show the carryover effect feeding for 21 days postpartum on, mil on milk, but what if you fed it longer, would mammary cells maintain their integrity for a longer period of time? So we fed choline in one ex as a single experiment that uh, we uh, fed for 21 days or we kept feeding for 105 days at a dose of 12.9 grams of choline ion uh, in a room protected form. We did not see any benefit of extending beyond 21 days at that particular dose. Okay. 
Uh, but like I mentioned, there are other experiments out there in which they fed twice to four times as many grams of choline ion, 45 grams per day, and they showed benefits when cows were in meat lactation. So I wouldn't discard that that can be the case. Uh, yeah, but in our case, we didn't see a benefit of keeping the same dose beyond 21 days postpartum. Just to, as I look at this data from multiple experiments now, you know, from my limited knowledge of memory cell biology, I have to think that choline is affecting uh, the number of uh, secretory cells. You just don't get this continued uh, persistence of production without affecting either reducing cell death or uh, maintaining cell actives for a longer period of time. I don't think it's just a nutrient effect early on. Maybe not necessarily be a direct effect, as I hypothesize, it may be an indirect effect, but I would say that to continuously get another two or three kilos of milk when you stop the intervention, there has to be effects on uh, the memory cells there. Um, I was uh, intrigued again by the data, Heather, I think you showed with the meta-analysis, you, you put your data over the top of that and showed higher production cows, uh, showing a similar impact, if I remember right. Um, and I, I don't think there was an impact on production in the first three weeks, but it was a tendency later on, if I, if I remember that right. So is there, um, other than your point of saying Wisconsin cows maybe produce more than... Uh... <laughs> oh, okay. All right. No. <laughs> other than and then that piece, is there any reason to believe uh, physiologically there's enough difference in different production cows that uh, the response doesn't hold up as well at higher production levels or... There's enough other things that are uh, corrected, forage quality management, cow comfort, et cetera, that uh, the, the response may not be there. Is there a lot of data at that same production level that supports similar to what you were saying um, with a similar response or, or not necessarily? Yeah, so uh, before I take a stab at answering that, I want to disclose, all joking aside, the meta-analysis covers like a couple decades of research, right? So the fact that the cows in our study made 35% more ECM than the average of the meta-analysis is also influenced by production level over three decades, different days fed, different products, right? There's a lot of things. So of course, when I'm giving a talk in Wisconsin, I love to say, hey, we're doing a good job. Wisconsin cows are making more milk. But uh, that joke aside, uh, it is intriguing to see that we still see a response that high of production level as the default or the starting point, right? So um, I'm trying to remember, Jose, if you and Usman did this in your meta-analysis, but Rick Grummer did a really interesting approach when he did one of the first meta-analyses where he went through and he said, what's the likelihood that if you feed it, you won't see a response, which is the question on everybody's mind, right? And he found a very slim error, basically, right? If we talk about type one, type two error, a very slim error that you would feed it and not see a response. And it wasn't different by starting point production level. And as you saw plenty of data today, it doesn't seem to be affected by body condition score um, or any of those factors, right? So it does seem to be a response across the board, which makes sense if we think about the mechanism of action being through liver metabolism, nutrient use efficiency, maybe mammary gland action, which I agree Probably some of that's going on. I don't want to be the one that tests it, but probably some of it's going on. Um, and so I haven't seen any reason to suspect that it wouldn't happen with some random subset of the cows that we haven't magically thought to question yet. I think we've all run the data a lot of different ways, and there's a lot of farms that put cows on it compared to cows that aren't on it. Um, so I think it's a pretty consistent response, which again, makes sense based on the biology and the mechanism. Yeah, I, and I anecdotally in the field, I would tend to agree. I think, you know, you do see the responses at high production levels. I was just surprised by how, how far above, you know, I mean, those production responses are really different, right? Um, or those cows are really different as you get the higher production responses. So I was just surprised by how big a gap there was in that data in the analysis. So thanks. It, if you look at Barry's study, I mean, on a, those, his graph was on a just pure milk yield, but if you looked at energy corrected milk, those cows were producing quite high as well. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a nine pound response in his study.
Very well. All right. Um, why don't we switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about in utero programming. And Jose, I'm going to throw this to you first because I think the first research that we'd seen uh, was started probably by Charlie Staples. So why don't you talk us through a little bit about what is epigenetics and what role does choline play in epigenetics? <laughs> Big question. question. You got another yeah. hour? <laughs> well, epigenetics is uh, this new field that... Uh, <clears throat> how you can change your genome without changing the sequences in your genome, but by altering how genes express themselves. And you can do this one way is through this methylation reactions. Usually when uh, genes or uh, histones in the genes, the things that surround the, the DNA are methylated, they receive a methyl group then the uh, chromatin doesn't spread, doesn't, doesn't uh, extend, and then the gene cannot be read properly. So it doesn't get expressed, and then the protein is not produced, and that changes the function uh, of a particular phenotype. Yeah? It alters a particular phenotype. And this all came about from uh, epidemiological work that was done in, in, uh, by a, a, a physician in, in England in which he looked at data from uh, years, uh, either uh, through gestation length or famine, uh, that he showed that the risk of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease or chronic disease in humans that went through the Second World War, or uh, people who were born uh, with short gestation or light birth weights, they had a much greater risk uh, of developing uh, later in life disease. And that creates this whole field of epigenetics, which to me, I think we tend to try to explain too many things with epigenetics. I guess when we don't have an explanation, we say that's probably changes in the epigenome of the individual. But uh, I'm not making jokes. It's actually a pretty serious area, and it's a very complicated area that is above and beyond me. But choline through betaine plays an uh, important role on that. And probably the best uh, example would be anybody who, any woman who's pregnant or anybody who's married to a woman who was pregnant probably had to get 400 micrograms of uh, uh, folic acid every day. And that's to avoid narrow tube defect, which comes when you have uh, folic acid deficiency and that creates these changes in methylation that creates abnormalities in the phenotype. And that's a pretty... Uh, bad ad abnormality yeah, to have a narrow tube defect on a baby. So uh, choline through the process of producing betaine can affect the epigenome. Uh, in the case of the experiments that have been discussed here, the epigenome of the placenta, for example, perhaps the epigenome of the memory cells, the epigenome of the baby calf, and that can alter the phenotype of the individual for either good or bad, yeah? So you can go either direction depend upon what gets uh, methylated, what genes are affected, and then what genes are primarily silenced, but they can be overexpressed. But it's a sort of a, uh, how should, it's, it's not a targeted approach. Eh? We have no control over that. If I feed more methyl donors, more methionine, I have no idea what's gonna happen uh, relative to methylation. The expectation is that there will be something good coming out of that, which in general, that's what people observe through this methyl donor groups uh, uh, influencing animal responses. So uh, people are interested in that area because it can affect how the calf behaves. Perhaps that can affect how the calf grows uh, relative to uh, resistance to disease, perhaps. But uh, we are just crawling at this time uh, in the bovine research yeah. so there's not a lot of data there there and and the biggest challenge we have is that for those experiments we need large number of animals and these are all interventions that are done through diet we have to feed animals individually to have the animal as the experimental unit and that creates a major limitation what we can accomplish it's a, it's a slow process eventually we'll learn more i think so just kind of briefly, uh, I know you've got, done some research. What are some of the outcomes you've seen in calves? 
So in a study that, uh, an experiment that uh, uh, Juan Bolatti and Marco Zenobi did when they were in grad school at Florida, uh, they looked at uh, colostrum yield from the cows and in both experiments, colostrum yield increased. So that's somewhat of a consistent response. You saw that here today. Barry showed some data. I think Heather maybe also showed some data. So these cows produce more colostrum. But then the calves that were born from cows that received choline, we randomized them, or, or choline or control diet, we randomized them to receive either colostrum from choline-fed cows or control cows and, and vice versa. So we, in the, in the calf part, we arranged that as a two by two factorial uh, uh, in the experiment. But calves that were born from choline-fed cows, uh, they uh, perform better. It's a small experiment, had 100 calves. Uh, they perform better. And uh, in the male calves, the bull calves, when they were also fed colostrum from the dams and they were challenged with LPS, none of them died. When the calves were born from uh, control dams and fed colostrum from control dams, I think 30% uh, of them died from the LPS challenge. So there's, there's, there's some indication showing that they can withstand a uh, challenge better. Perhaps they have uh, less of a pro-inflammatory response to uh, an LPS challenge, which is sort of a, a bomb that we give to the calf. It doesn't necessarily mimic a disease event, but it gives you insights on that process. So there were benefits to doing that. Heather, I want to circle back real quick on the epigenetic aspects. And for the benefit of our listening audience who did not hear the uh, presentation today, can you talk a little bit about the results you saw in the calves uh, in your research study? Yeah, so overall in our study, uh, we observed an improvement in average daily gain in the zero to two week range in the Holstein heifer calves uh, and not later, but in the beef cross calves, the Holstein by Angus calves, we observed an increase from four to eight weeks and then improvements in the body weight from two to nine months and then feed efficiency in the finishing period. So we put them on a basically a, a six week feed efficiency study as they were growing. Um, we saw some differences in uh, metabolites, circulating metabolites, and really interestingly, improvements in marbling score in the beef cross calves. Uh, to get back to what Jose was saying, it's it's not a targeted focus with epigenetics and we were asking the same question did supplementing the cow with choline influence dna methylation and so we took a really big picture approach and we measured global dna methylation so you take a blood sample and you just measure snapshot big picture dna methylation so we didn't look gene by gene or anything like that and we did see an improvement in the beef cross male calves in, in global methylation. But what's really interesting is we saw improvement in growth in all of the female calves too, and we didn't see an increase in uh, methylation. And that brings up some really interesting things. First of all, the approach is global. So it's big picture. We don't know if there wasn't methylation that's targeted to genes in all of the animals because we didn't dig into that. But the other thing is that we do know across species, methylation patterns are offspring sex dependent. And Jose, that was something that you didn't uh, address. I'd be interested to know if you guys have looked at those interactions, interactions by sex at all in any of the studies. I think you had the one study with bull calves and heifer calves, right? Um, but across species, we know that male offspring have differences in methylation and they're more likely to show increases in methylation patterns than female. Um, so that's, that's just something to throw out there that exists. Despite that, we saw improvements in growth in male and female, in Holstein heifers and in the beef cross. And so I think that really highlights what Jose said is, yeah, methylation of DNA epigenetics is probably one part of it, uh, but I don't think it's the whole, the whole explanation. Guys, this has been a lot of fun, but it is last call, and I've been out of bourbon for about 20 minutes now so we're gonna to have to call this thing to a close what I'd like to do is have each of you guys kind of share a key takeaway from our conversation today and uh, Mike I'm gonna start with you what's one key takeaway from our conversation tonight's last call question is brought to you by Niasure precision release niacin 
Niacin is a proven vasodilator for heat stress reduction and a powerful antilipolytic agent for lowering high blood NEFA in transition cows. Protected with Balchem's proprietary encapsulation technology, you can be sure it is being delivered where and when your cows need it. Learn more at balchem.com slash niacer. Well, nothing that I talked about. It's what I heard from everybody else here that I'm thrilled as a guy who's spent quite a bit of time working on calves that you guys can show metabolic responses to calves um, from either in utero effects or colostrum is fantastic. So keep it up. Very well. Jose? It's complicated. <laughs> it's not simple, eh? And it's one experiment at a time to build a story that hopefully we have correct hypotheses and we can test them, but it's complicated. All right. Very well. Clay? Uh, I, I think the research speaks for itself uh, as far as choline being a required nutrient for transition cows. We consistently see these responses and um, the responses are, I think we're actually getting better over time in these higher producing cows. Well, I, I will overlap a little bit on the consistency, but from a different angle. For me, it's that when everything points to something, it makes us feel really good about something because we can do studies a bunch of different ways. We can analyze data a bunch of different ways. But when you get the same overall pattern, either in the metabolic pathways in production responses in the, the pathways that are coming up important, that tells me that we're looking in the right places. We're looking at the right direction for mechanism, for, for nutrition, for nutrient use efficiency. And that means keep it up, keep going, right? More studies. Keep us busy until we retire, which is quite a while for me. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you for the distinguished speakers today. Great presentations. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the live audience for joining us here. And thank you to our loyal listeners here at the Real Science Exchange. Thank you for joining us here once again. We hope you learned something. We hope you had some fun. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash realscience to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.